Good morning and welcome this morning to Bower Hill Church. Grace to you and peace in Jesus Christ our Lord. Please join in the call to worship, which is in the bulletin that we sent out to you. Through our baptism, we are dead to sin. Now we are alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us pray. Teach us, good Lord, Lord, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for any reward, save that of knowing that we do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Merciful, holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our failure to be what you created us to be. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. By your loving mercy, help us to live in your light and abide in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Anyone who is in Christ Jesus is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In him we are forgiven. Amen.
Good morning once again, or good afternoon, or whatever time of day you are participating in this worship event. We are glad that you choose to be with us, as always. And we hope that you sense the presence of not only your fellow worshipers and your fellow church members, but of the God we serve. We uh, are grateful for your presence and ask you always to join us every Sunday and to keep us in your prayers as we continue to keep you in our prayers. I have a few announcements to call to your attention today. Um, thank you, many of you did step up to, to think about and uh, to discuss serving on session. We're very grateful for that, very grateful. Um, we do still need people to serve as deacons. And so if you have served as a deacon before and if you'd like to give it uh, a go again, or if you're interested in diaconal service, you'd get that great word, diaconal, uh, applied to you. So uh, please talk to me if you would be interested in serving as a deacon in this church. Uh, also, happy Father's Day to you. Uh, today we pause to recognize the men in our lives who have made us who we are, our fathers, our uncles, our brothers, and for male role models of all kinds, whether they are indeed fathers or not. We pause today to pay tribute to you. This time we have a minute for mission. Thank you, Brian. Good morning. My name is Linda James. I'm chair of the mission committee. I'd like to bring you two issues this morning. Um, you will receive next week from the mission committee a survey. Um, the mission committee is looking for your input into what issues Bower Hill should be responding to and whether we should be joining the organization PIN, which stands for Pennsylvania Interfaith Impact Network, a network of other churches and organizations that we can work with on issues that Bower Hill is concerned about. Please complete the survey and either return it through the mail or electronically through email as soon as possible. On the second issue, we are in the process of helping our immigrant neighbors. As many of us got assistance from the government, they have not gotten any. Um, 
they have been able to get boxes of food at food banks, but that does not include diapers, baby wipes, and cleaning supplies. During the month of July, we will be collecting diapers, wipes, and cleaning supplies. You will see an article in the July newsletter on specifics. If you prefer to write a check to do a donation, you can do that also. Help us to help our neighbors. Thank you. Let's pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit, O God, and prepare our hearts to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our reading from the Hebrew Scriptures today is taken once again from the book of Genesis. We're in Genesis chapter 21, beginning at verse 8. I would ask you to pay special attention to this reading because this is the one that the sermon will be based on, even though it comes earlier in the sequence. Remember last week we heard about the birth of Isaac, the child of laughter, and this week we are hearing a little bit more in that story. The child Isaac grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son Ishmael. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you to do, do as she tells you. For it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him too, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water, and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she, sent, then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bowshot, for she said, Do not let me look upon the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and she wept. God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid. For God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make of him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our psalm this reading to echo that reading. Our psalm is Psalm 86, verses 1 through 10 and 16 through 17. Please join in the responsive reading of Psalm 86. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am devoted to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all day long. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, 
are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my cry of supplication. In the day of my trouble I call on you, for you will answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and bow down before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant. Save the child of your serving girl. Show me a sign of your favor, so that those who hate me may see it and be put to shame because of you, Lord. You have helped me and comforted me. And our third scripture reading is our gospel lesson taken from the gospel according to St. Matthew. Matthew chapter 10 and verses 24 through 39. As always, listen to hear what the Spirit might say to you today in this reading from Matthew. Jesus is speaking here and he says some hard words. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell it in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on the earth. I have come not to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. May God bless to our understanding this reading from God's holy word, and to God's name be glory and praise. Amen. What troubles you, Hagar? A gentle voice seems to whisper across the bright and waterless desert. What troubles you? The answer should seem pretty obvious. I have heard your cry, your call of lament, at the seemingly certain death of your child. I have heard your lonely wailing and hear it still. In the cries of the unwanted, the disinherited, the incarcerated, the misunderstood. What troubles you, Hagar? Did I not promise you my presence and my blessing? Is that not why I bid you name your child Ishmael, which means God hears? Oh, and God indeed does hear. And you, wherever you find yourself today, God hears. The ugly cries of your heart that others only hear perhaps as you're indifferent, as you're complaining, 
or as your arrogance or as your self-centeredness. God hears them for what they are, your declarations of need, your busyness, your self-importance, your name-dropping, your tendency to know it all. I don't know. God hears these things as what they are, the cries of an uncertain heart. Your desperation, your loudness, your anger, perhaps even your inclination toward violence if you have one, God hears these as what they are. God hears beneath the noise that you and I make to the cracking voice of our hearts and you. You who raise the cry of lament so often and so unawares in your own life, in acts of perhaps pettiness or irritability or even road rage, how can you fail to hear Hagar's lament, echoing eerily out over the deserts and the wastelands and the cityscapes and the broken places of our world today? Hagar, the rejected wife, the former slave. Ishmael, the disowned child, her son. Oh, but know this. The promise of the name Ishmael is that God hears. You are heard. Even when you fail to recognize the note of lament in your own behaviors and in your own voice and in your own life, you are heard by the one who knows you most fully. But do you hear? Do you hear Hagar's lament? Several weeks ago for Pentecost Sunday, I said that we need to hear ourselves and the other. Today I want to think about the way we fail to hear the cries of need in the things that we hear all the time because we've stopped hearing. Jesus said it frequently, and Jesus said it well. Let the one who has ears to hear, hear. But hearing tends to come down to a question of habits. We have lived out at our house in South Fayette for a full decade now. I cannot believe it. We bought the place back in June of 2010. It is a money pit, and it is a cantankerous old thing, and I hate it as much as I love it, at least. But that's not what I want to talk to you about today. When we first moved into the place, I could not abide the noise in its location. On the one hand, it was a little quieter than the house we lived in just before, which was also a grand old antique of a place, but on the main street of a small town. That house sat right at the spot where the two-lane U.S. Route 6 makes a dog leg and all the big lumber trucks and the big oil trucks would quickly have to slow down and shift gears as they went around the corner. They would come grinding and barreling past the front room of our house and for a few seconds they'd be aimed right at us. Those enormous and heavy machines, they would violate our private space with their headlights Roaring like dragons who wanted in, not 30 feet away. It was loud. When we moved into the place in South Fayette, it was a different kind of noise. It wasn't frequent and ear-splitting like our old place. It was constant and high-pitched, always there. It was the sound of I-79 screaming and whining and groaning about a quarter mile away, maybe less. It too sounded like dragons, though I've never heard dragons. It sounded and still sounds like dragons at war, dragons in concert, dragons arguing over who pays the bill. All day, every day, all night. Indeed, the thing I recall most vividly about our first Christmas in that house is waking up at 5 p.m., to the sound of perfect silence on Christmas morning. A quiet so profound and so pure that I both treasured it and almost feared it. The dragons had declared a Christmas truce. I never thought I would get used to that kind of noise. I never believed that I would cease to hear the snarl of the engine brakes 
the combined moan of a fleet of cars and engines passing by, the lash of the wind over those unaerodynamic trucks with their rectangular backs, the howling of them all as they sped past. But nowadays, 10 years later, I, I don't even notice it. In fact, several days ago, I mentioned the highway noise to one of my daughters. They've lived most of their lives in that house. And that daughter said, what? That, that humming sound? Oh yeah, I hear it. I never noticed that before. It is hard to hear a thing that you've grown used to. And it's hard not to hear a thing that you're not used to. Our hearing has to do with what we grow accustomed to and what we listen for. There are things we stop hearing because they make their way into the the regular old soundtrack of our days and we begin to take them for granted. Funny the things you hear when you're out in your tent alone at night, though backyard suburban campers in greater Pittsburgh could be forgiven if they thought they heard a bear a few nights ago in Pittsburgh because they did, not even in the suburbs. When you're in your tent at night and you hear the snapping of a twig out there in the darkness, some large, lumbering, ungainly creature out there trying to be quiet and failing. Oh, our hearing is keen when there might be danger afoot. But most of the time, we hear what we're accustomed to hearing. And the rest, we just let it pass. Most of the time, we can drift through life trusting our lazy senses. Life habits cause us to incur a sort of hearing loss, especially when the likes of Hagar raise their cry of lament from the margins of the world, from the deserts of our society. Oh, let us hear Hagar's lament. Well, if our own hearing is conditioned by outside factors, then we can take some comfort in the fact that the name Ishmael means God hears. You and I might not hear, but God hears. There is just so much to catch up on on this whirlwind whirlwind tour of the book of Genesis. The schemes, the deceits, the old jealousies that nest in the pages of Genesis. The strong personalities, the moral failings in otherwise decent human beings. Where to start? Years earlier, in the story, the saga of Abraham trying to become a great nation, years earlier, when it became obvious that Sarah could not have a child, and before Isaac ever came along, the same Sarah had talked Abraham into having a child with her slave woman, Hagar, and becoming a great nation that way. And so maybe Abraham would become the father of a great nation after all, even if not by way of Sarah's womb. It worked. Hagar bore a son named Ishmael to Abraham. And it seemed that maybe everybody would have to gear up and get along with plan B. But then, of course, as we learned last week, Sarah herself had Isaac, laughter, the child of laughter. And plan A is back on the table. Everyone is laughing except maybe Ishmael and his mother Hagar. Ah, but that's the problem. Ishmael does laugh. On the day of the celebration of Isaac's weaning, Ishmael laughs as he plays with his little half-brother, And Sarah sees it, Ishmael laughing, and she cannot endure it. She cannot bear to think that this son of a slave would have any place in the nation that her own child was destined to rule. Indeed, in the Hebrew, there's a little play on words here. You know that the word Isaac means laughter. 
And in the verb form, it says here that Ishmael was playing with, but it actually means laughing. Ishmael was laughing with Isaac. And the question is, the text asking us if Ishmael was actually Isaacing. It gets kind of convoluted. Ishmael was Isaacing. Was was Ishmael going to out Isaac Isaac? Wait, nobody is supposed to be Isaacing here except my son, Isaac himself. Only the laugh the laughter, only the one who laughs gets to laugh. Will he supplant his half brother, this this son of a slave? Will he take his place? Will he outlaugh him? Will he laugh last? Wait a minute, Buster. Nobody laughs around here except my Isaac. Send them out. Send them out into the desert to die. I will not have this slave woman and her child taking up resources and rights and roles that belong to me and to my child. And so Abraham does. He sends them away. After receiving assurance from an angel that Ishmael and his mother are going to be okay in the end. And they are. But Sarah, how could you? Sarah, last week we felt such sympathy for you, such admiration. You were so strong in the face of all those years of disappointment. Sarah, the long-suffering. Sarah, the self-deprecating. Sarah, the sweetly sarcastic. Sarah, the never too old to laugh. She was strong. She got the joke. Now Sarah is the privileged and the blessed. She is no stranger to weeping. She's no stranger to misfortune herself. She knows the pains of childlessness in that society. And she knows the pains of motherhood too. Let me ask you, how can one mother treat another mother this way? How can Sarah the blessed treat Ishmael and Hagar, the other mother, as she does? For Sarah, too, is a mother. How can she say, away with them? They'll have no place alongside my son. We're done with them. Plan B can be erased now. The promise was never met for them. It was for me. That is sometimes what privilege does to a society and to an individual. It doesn't make us bad, it just makes us a little bit blind to the fact that what we got, we didn't give ourselves. It was a gift. Privilege can be a blinding thing. It causes us to lose sight of the fact that we, who have also known desperation and pain in a different way, We have been blessed and lucky and fortunate and gifted by God. Privilege can lull us into the easy belief that everything we've given, everything we've been given, we gave ourselves. In Sarah's case, it was laughter, it was Isaac, it was the miracle baby, it was the bright future. Nobody gave me any privileges, we often say. I worked for everything I've got, and it's true, except we started perhaps from a more secure place, and that itself is privilege. Sarah? Sarah is deaf to Hagar's lament. Sarah, who should have been Hagar's closest ally and defender, mother to mother. Sarah should have been Hagar's truest friend. There's no reason they couldn't be. But it is the lady of the house, the lady of the manor, the queen of God-given privilege, who denies a poor slave woman and her child not just a place in that great nation that is to be, but a very place on earth, anything at all. She does not hear Hagar's lament. But though she does not hear, God hears. Friends, I know that these are worn-out days. I know that you are tired of many things. I know that you're weary of social distancing and all the strange limitations that the pandemic has made necessary in our times, being unable to celebrate life's passages with the people you love, 
graduations skipped, birthdays done small, all the close-knit groups still unable to meet except online. And not just that. I know that you're bone tired of the politics in our times with their long parade of filthy characters creating endless distractions. Distractions so that we who are trained to chase after the shiniest things and the noisiest things will fail to look at the real issues. I know that you're tired of talking too about class and wealth and poverty and race. I know it because I'm tired of it. For once at the end of a normal work week, I would like to look in this strange year at the scriptures for next week's church service and say, hmm, isn't this pleasant? Isn't this nice? Let's have a sermon about prayer next week. Let's talk about fasting. We never talk about that. Let's talk about keeping Sabbath. Let's talk about some of the meanings of the Lord's Supper. I would love that. I would love to stick to abstract spiritual things that have not a thing to do with what's going on in the news. Believe me, that's why I became a pastor, to talk about those things. But that would be spiritual escapism. And I don't think Jesus was ever into that. We still live in a world with Hagar's and Sarah's, a world where the privileged are afraid of the unprivileged, a world where the privileged Sarah's are forever casting the unwanted Hagar's into the deserts to fend for themselves. And we participate in those systems. We don't do it on purpose. We don't want that to happen, and if we could see it happening personally, we would probably rise against it. But we don't. We participate, sometimes unwittingly, in big broken broken systems that keep some folks and their children on top, making sure that other folks and their children never get a chance. We didn't invent the systems, you and I, but we have benefited from them, and we benefit from them still. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something difficult, and I know it's difficult because I tried it myself beforehand. I'm going to ask you to try to hear without becoming defensive. You got that? It's hard. It's really hard to hear without being defensive. But God has heard your cries again and again. And instead of coming to you and saying, what, you don't like the world I made? God has listened. And I dare say God has delivered you. God heard old Sarah's cries even and gifted her with laughter, with Isaac, even though God surely knew beforehand that Sarah would turn out being cruel to Hagar. God heard. God hears. That's the promise. If you and I are to be followers of Christ, then we too must hear the pain of the world. We must hear it without becoming defensive for our tribe or our team. We must hear it first as agents of Christ's kingdom, not as members of any race or political party. Our first allegiance is to the God who hears, the same God who heard us in our sadness or our lostness, or our brokenness. The very God to whom we have cried out in our loneliness, our anger, our shame, our desperation. Our first allegiance must be to the God who shows mercy on the just and on the unjust, and as often as not we have been numbered among the latter and received mercy all the same. Here, as well as you have been heard. If the statement black lives matter offends you, then you're not hearing it. If in that statement you hear white lives don't matter, or if you hear police lives don't matter, then you're just not hearing it clearly. You're hearing it through the ears of race or class or clan. But hear it with mercy, 
the way God hears us. If you had been beaten down for 400 years, how could anyone blame you when you stand up and say, hey, I matter? And if Christ the Good Shepherd leaves the 90 and 9 to seek and to save the one who is at risk and at danger, shall the 90 and 9 stand back safely in the meadow holding signs that read, all sheep matter? No. Hear with mercy. And truly, let's not pretend to say that all lives matter in our society. All lives matter until someone dies in an ICE facility, and then, well, they shouldn't have come here illegally. All lives matter until you want to go to a restaurant, and then, well, hey, only old people die of COVID. All lives matter until someone overdoses, and then, well, you know, addiction, it's kind of a choice. All lives matter until a transgender person is murdered and we see it on the news, then, well, you know, they were kind of promiscuous and kind of a pervert anyway. It's so easy to judge the world when our experience of it has put us in a place of relative status. Yes, you have worked hard in your life. I don't doubt it. I really don't but you attended a school that was funded well enough to teach you the three R's. You probably grew up without street gangs and much threat of street violence and overcrowded conditions and the psychological damage and shame that attends real deep down generational poverty. Poverty maybe, but that kind of poverty, I don't know. Yes, perhaps you have had to fight for everything you've got. Shouldn't that make you more sympathetic to those who have had to fight even harder? Sarah and Hagar ought to be natural allies. They ought to be friends. But they're not. When I watched our worship video from last week, I had to blush with deep shame when I, at a certain point in the sermon, realized, as I watched myself, that instead of saying themselves, I said their selves. So embarrassing. In the same sermon where I brag about having been an English teacher, and yet, it is illustration to the point that I, too, have come a long way in life. And I come from a different background. It would be easy to say, no one ever gave me any privileges, but you know what? They did. They really did. The whole system was set up for guys like me to make it, and I'm grateful for that. I had a decent public education. I had a good enough home life. At least I didn't have to worry about hunger. I was, I was able to get for myself a used car and thus a job, and then student loans. I was able to do that. These are privileges that are denied to some. Sadly, it is our own histories, it is our own stories, it is our own life baggage that keeps us from hearing Hagar's lament. When Hagar cries out for her own life and the life of her child, it just sounds like so much complaining, so much entitlement, so much asking for more, more, more handouts just the annoying background noise noise of our world. But God has heard you, and God hears Hagar. Therapists and clergy are taught that whenever someone comes to you with a complaint, you need to listen for two things. First, there is the presenting issue, and it can be a real problem for people. The presenting issue, my wife is messy. I, I... you know, I'm speaking for a friend. My wife is messy, or the preacher talks too fast. Those are presenting issues. But beneath the presenting issue, there is always an underlying issue, a deeper issue, a bigger complaint. My wife is too messy is the presenting issue. The underlying issue might be, and she knows I can't stand it, She knows I like things to be clean, and so when she's messy, it makes me feel unheard. It makes me feel unloved. It makes me feel unvalued. Or the preacher talks too fast, 
is the presenting issue, and maybe he does. But maybe the underlying issue is it means that I can't understand and I must be getting old. And I don't want to get old. I want to be young still. I don't want to get close to death. Much of the time, you and I, we don't even know our own presenting issues. Or, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Let me re-say that. Most of the time, you and I, we don't even know our own underlying issues. We know our presenting issues. We know those very well. We can list them. And our spouses, if we have them, know them too. And the people in our lives, they know our presenting issues, but our underlying issues, we don't even know most of those. We almost always miss underlying issues in ourselves and in other people most of the time. Most of the time, we do not look for their underlying issues. In our relationships, let us listen for the real fear, the real pain, the real underlying issues beneath the things that people say to us. It will make a difference in every relationship and in our world. Let us never fail to hear and to respond with mercy the fear and the pain in Hagar's lament. Hear the heart cry beneath all the noise. The name Ishmael means God hears. Let us try to hear as well as we have been heard. Amen. As God's people called to love one another, let us pray for the needs of the church and of the whole human family in all the world, saying, O God, hear our prayer. That churches of all traditions may discover their unity in Christ and exercise their gifts of service for all. We pray to you, O God. Hear our prayer. That the earth may be freed from war, famine, and disease, and the air, soil, and waters cleansed of poison, we pray to you, O God. Hear our prayer. That those who govern and maintain peace in every land may exercise their powers in obedience to your commands, we pray to you, O God. Hear our prayer. That you will strengthen this nation to pursue just priorities so that the races may be reconciled, the young educated, the old cared for, the hungry filled, and the homeless housed, and the sick comforted and healed. We pray to you, O God. Hear our prayer. That you will preserve all who live and work in this community in peace and safety. We pray to you, O God. Hear our prayer. That you will comfort and empower any who face difficulty or trial, the sick and those who mourn. Especially today, we pray for Jeff Carper, for Denny Geis, for Nancy Geis, for Mary Gorski, Jim McAnulty, Andrew Astorita, Jeff Conte, Tommy DeSantis, Franciel Hummel, Melody Cronwald, Tim May, 
Brian McFeely, Rick Miller, Luann Patterson, Virginia Reinstatler, Sarah Stovall, those whom we name before you now in the silence of our own hearts. For these we pray to you, O God. Hear our prayer. That you will accept our thanksgiving for all faithful servants of Christ now at rest, who with us await a new heaven and a new earth, and your everlasting kingdom. We pray to you, O God. Hear our prayer. And we ask you to hear us for the sake of the one who teaches us when we pray to say, Our, our Father, Father, who art, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be, be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come thy, thy will, will be done, done on earth, earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And misery relieved Where truth is spoken Children's fair Equality achieved We welcome one world family And struggle with each choice That opens us to unity And gives our vision voice The poor are rich The weak are strong The foolish ones are wise We thank you for joining us once again today. Please do uh, continue to take part in the life of the church. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook. You can follow events online. You can drop us a line. You can give us a call. We are still available to you and uh, look forward to a day when we can once again worship together. And now receive the benediction. Go into the world knowing compassion and seeking justice. Give voice to the silent give strength to the weak, see one another, hear one another, love one another. It is as simple as that and indeed very hard. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>